9-11 was a defining moment. The deadly terrorist attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center provoked a huge counter-terrorist response from the US and its allies that politicians dubbed the War on Terror. In the 10 years since 9-11, the world has changed. We were told that terrorists had to be rooted out, eradicated and destroyed through military force. Inside Western societies, the threat of terrorism now seems ever-present. A state of exception has been created where we have to be permanently ready for catastrophic terrorist attacks. The rule of law has been eroded and civil liberties have been rolled back. On the 10th anniversary of 9-11, I travelled up to Glasgow for an academic conference. The conference has attracted people from all over the world to get together and ask what have we learnt about terrorism and counter-terrorism in the 10 years since 9-11. For the next three days, scholars will be presenting their research and working through issues with each other as they try to further their understanding of terrorism and counter-terrorism. In this film, I'll be speaking to some of the people at the conference. I'll ask them to pick up on some of the points they raised and I'll try to unknot some of the ideology that has infused the dominant ways of thinking about what terrorism is and how best to reduce it. Kicking off the conference was Professor Richard Jackson. During his talk, he pointed out that the threat of terrorism isn't quite what it's made out to be. So you think that terrorism isn't that big a problem, is that right? All the evidence that we have, by any measure that you can uh, imagine, uh, shows that terrorism is really not a big threat. The fact is that if you look at statistics, for example, and if you look at the history of terrorism, uh, in reality terrorists have killed somewhere between three and 3,000 people per year over the whole world uh, for the last 45 years, uh, which in, in real terms amounts to less than the people who have died from suicide, for example, uh, less in some years than the people who've died from drowning in bathtubs. Um, in America, there have been periods, uh, quite long periods, when uh, more people have died from lightning strikes than from terrorism. Uh, certainly in Europe, more people die from peanut allergies, probably, than terrorism. And, and, and so from all those kinds of measures, uh, I think it is fair to say that the evidence shows that, that terrorism is really not the massive apocalyptic kind of threat that the media uh, and politicians uh, and some kinds of uh, terrorism experts make it out to be. But despite what the numbers say, we still live in a climate of fear. During the conference, Professor Haseba Zuleika pointed out that our fascination with terrorism started long before 9-11. It is this creation of the collective representation and this kind of waiting for terror. Uh, 80, 85, I think those six years there were like six or seven people who were labeled as terrorist killing in the United States. They're probably related to the Cubans in Miami. Or nobody remembers who they are. Every one of those years there were 25,000 murders in the United States. This is just ordinary murder. They were not any problem to national security. But these six murders in six years, these were a major. And in one survey, like 85% thought that terrorism was the enemy number one when there had been nothing in the 80s in the United States. In fact, between 89 and 93, in four years in the United States, there was not a single terrorist fatality in, in the United States. During those four years, there were over 1,500 books on terrorism in the United States. There had been a single 
So there comes an issue of, is this a real thing or is just a sideshow, it's just a fiction they have created. So we have heard so many times in all the major media outlets, it's not if, but when. So you take it for granted it's going to happen that any day the terrorists are going to throw a bomb in a major city. You are just in a way promoting that yeah, you have to strike against these actors before they, because they are going to do it. It is this non-hypothetical that used to be typical in, uh, in divination societies where you knew that something was going to happen because some mystical force told you or some secret knowledge told you about it. So there is that kind of uh, fatalistic kind of outcome. It is going to happen, so let's just prevent it. These experts, commentators, they're telling you this as something that is going to happen. You are just pushing into a self-fulfilling prophecy by doing it. Yeah. I guess something that strikes me about this, this manufacture of a permanent state of exception is that it seems to lower the bar for the West to use violence politically. I mean, if, if, if there is always a terrorist out there and we're always on edge and we always have to be very conscious to defend ourselves because they could strike from anywhere at any time, it seems to be a lot easier for countries in the global north to use violence and to legitimate it whenever they want. The war on terrorism and the discourse of the war on terrorism has been fantastic for Western uh, political leaders and for security elites uh, and for anyone who wants to use uh, forms of military intervention. I mean in that sense 9-11 was a godsend because it allowed them to create and construct this uh, massive threat but luckily it's a threat that that's not just located in one country. I mean the problem with the Cold War was that it was all centered on the Soviet Union and so you had to make more of a case to try and say, well, the Soviet Union was in control of, I, I don't know, Nicaragua or Angola or some other country, and therefore that's why we had to go and fight there. But now, because terrorists could be anywhere, they could be anyone, they're, they're kind of this, this phantom that pops up all over the place, uh, and because we don't know who they are really, uh, but, but we do know that there are thousands upon thousands of them out there. We don't know what their intentions are, but we know that they're going to use weapons of mass destruction against us. Uh, this provides the perfect kind of discourse, the perfect kind of foil, if you like, to say, well, we have to intervene here, we have to intervene there. And you'll notice that, you know, it keeps changing. I mean, for a long period, uh, Iraq was the center of, of all the danger. And so we had to intervene massively there. Then, then Afghanistan became that. And they talked about how plots in Afghanistan were then being acted out in Europe. Uh, recently, Yemen became the sort of center of danger. Uh, and so it's a, it's a shifting kind of discourse that allows you to sort of designate a particular country or a region as being a source of terrorist danger so that then you can justify all, all different kinds of military intervention. I mean, it's wonderful for that. Over the last 10 years, and let's say including 9-11 itself, would you say that the terrorist groups and organizations that are commonly understood to be terrorists have committed more or less violence than the US and other NATO allies over, over that 10-year period? Well, I think if you're talking purely about violence, then there's no question that uh, the reaction to 9-11 and the reaction to acts of terrorism has been far more lethal and destructive than the terrorism itself. I mean, we can easily do a, a, a sort of straightforward statistical analysis and say on 9-11 nearly 3,000 people were killed, but in the response to that in the war on terror, uh, somewhere between 120,000 and possibly 1.3 million people have died as a result of military operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, the Horn of Africa, and so on. In other words, the war against terrorism has killed far more people than the terrorism itself. Now, the interesting point about this is that this has always been the case, historically. Every terrorist campaign in history has produced a reaction against it that has killed far more people than the terrorism itself. In other words, counterterrorism always seems to be far more lethal, far more destructive, kill far more people than the terrorist, terrorism itself.
Of course, it's not only foreign countries that have been affected by Western counter-terror. The war on terror has also been fought within Western countries. On the second day of the conference, Professor Mary Hickman presented a paper which documented how, over the last decade, the Muslim community in the UK has become an object of suspicion. Because the research we did specifically wasn't looking at anybody who was uh, might be viewed as an activist or someone who'd ever been detained by the police or um, arrested. We were looking at people who were just going about their everyday lives. In fact, the quintessential moderate Muslim that the politicians and the media talk about. People have had, no, in the main, the only contact with the policing they've had is probably when they're travelling, when they're pulled to one side and given an extra sort of inquisition as they're travelling. Um, but that's the limit of it. So actually what we found that was that their lives have been materially affected because at work, from neighbours, even from friends, they have experienced different reactions and some of them very either verbally abusive or involving physical attacks since 2005 in particular. And even 2001, even though the um, obviously the bombing of the Twin Towers, etc., took place in America. So I think we got many incidences from people of, um, which shocked them really, because it would be people they'd known for some time uh, at work or where they lived who would perhaps uh, shun them or subject them to in, uh, a bit of interrogation. And it made them very uncomfortable, often uh, felt very alienated, felt like they were second class citizens. Do you think that the war on terror language has contributed to the rise of Islamophobia across Europe? There's no question about that. The, the, the war on terrorism and the broader terrorism discourse, in fact, has fused Islam in many senses with the word terrorism. And in many people's minds, when they think of a terrorist, the image that comes to their mind is of a Muslim person. Uh, and at the same time, uh, many of the experts in, in terrorism have said that the, the current wave of terrorism around the world is primarily religious and it's primarily Islamic. And so there's been a conflation. Now what that leads to directly is, at the social level, forms of discrimination and anger against Muslims. And so many mosques have been uh, uh, burnt or, or attacked and so many individual Muslims get, uh, get shouted at as you know, go home, you terrorist, uh, and things like that. And then at the same time, what we've seen, because there's this sort of broad general belief that terrorism and Islam are intimately connected, is a whole series of government programs aimed at Muslims. Now, the function of that is to single them out. The function of that is to make them recognize that they're under suspicion, and it's to make everyone else in society recognize and hey, that group over there, which is getting special attention, the reason for that is because they're all under suspicion. And I think this directly contributes to Islamophobia. The discourse of Islam as a threat has swept far and wide. For example, in Switzerland in 2009, there were only four minarets in the whole country, with proposals to build a couple more. However, that year, a large majority voted in a referendum to ban the building of new minarets. Once you create this, this discourse and ideology that we have to be waiting for terror, that the terrorists are here, and it's going to happen, it's not if but when, so in a way you have to detect where they are and the absence of any sense becomes really suspicious because we know they are here. We know it's going to happen. So if it's going to happen, I mean, where are they? So suddenly the possibility of two minerals in a country like Switzerland becomes a total threat. So we have to ban it. So this non-problem becomes a real problem because there should be a problem because now we know that terrorism is here. So, so that's how you are creating, forcing a phenomenon that is not there. 
The war on terror was characterized in terms of a crusade against evil, good against evil. And this is very much the language of George Bush and other people in his administration. But do you still think the symbolism of good versus evil, counterterrorism versus terrorism, is, is still there? And do you think that it's a useful way to see terrorists as, as somehow evil? Once you have this reification of the other as evil and yourself as, as, as the non-evil, it is then that you end up in a way reproducing what you are projecting on them. So you see their lawlessness as a per permission for you to be also lawless. If they are all contaminated, then you are acting like in a witchcraft society where everything that has been touched by the evil of, of the witch is contaminated and no longer you can touch it, it becomes untouchable. So this kind of mind frame is a promoter thinking that rather than resolving the phenomenon, allows you to behave in forms that are premodern, like torture. No other, no other subject, no other phenomenon would allow a modern country like the United States to openly embrace torture except terrorism, because the terrorists are supposed to be beyond any morality, beyond any law, beyond any politics, just pure criminals. So you are allowed to kind of uh, uh, exercise yourself part of their evil. The language of evil is a form of propaganda, really. It's, it's about trying to demonize your enemies and, more importantly, to delegitimize them. Delegitimize their grievances, delegitimize their struggles. If you can say so and so are fighting against us because they're pure evil, then you don't have to look at the reasons that they've put forward for why they're attacking you. I mean, it's a clear rhetorical strategy to avoid looking at the real issues. And I guess something that's related to that is that if they're terrorists, I mean, the whole, the whole language of counter-terror is an idea that we're reacting to their violence and that they're not reacting to ours. Could you talk a bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, the whole sort of discourse of uh, counter-terrorism and terrorism is rooted in a series of assumptions and a series of kind of binary divisions between them and us between our legitimate violence, which is in self-defense, and their illegitimate violence, which is, um, uh, you know, against us for no reason at all, just because they're evil. Uh, but this is completely untrue. I mean, this is a, this is a falsehood. Um, and it is a function of that discourse to hide the very real reasons that people have uh, for engaging in political violence. Another feature of the counter-terrorist discourse is that terrorism is something that other people do, but that we in the West don't. But a popular argument at the conference was that states can also act in terroristic ways, and that Western states have a long history of engaging in terrorism. On the last day of the event, I caught up with Professor David Miller and asked him why politicians, media commentators, and in particular academics, tend not to talk about the terrorism of states. Well, the definitions of terrorism uh, in the academic literature are, are notoriously difficult to pin down. There's been a survey, several surveys now, of how many definitions there are, some 200, maybe 300 definitions of terrorism. All of them, of course, have common features. Uh, they, they refer to uh, political violence, uh, which is, uh, involves threats of, of coercion or, or actual coercion. And some of them say it has to affect um, civilians or non-combatants. Uh, others say it can also include the military. But they, they're largely agreed in what they call terrorism. The question really is whether they are uh, able to apply their definitions in a, in a neutral or literal sort of way. And part of the problem with terrorism studies in, in the academy with uh, uh, people who study terrorism as well as with the media and policy debate is that they tend not to be literal, they tend to adopt a propagandistic version and, and they tend not to apply the definition of terrorism to their own side. So they might say that uh, the people who are their opponents are terrorists but they would never regard their own side even if they do the same kinds of things as terrorists. So that's, there's a difficulty there in, in the way in which the definition is used uh, in practice. But if one was to be literal about it, then the killing of civilians uh, for po particular political purposes uh, by Western states clearly matches the definition of terrorism, but is never described as such in the Western media or in Western policy circles. But you know, 
carpet bombing or the, the use of uh, the sophisticated weapons which the West uses in Afghanistan and Iraq. These are weapons intended to kill civilians, not to kill, to, to kill combatants and people who are in military uniform, but intended to destroy all life, not just human life, in a particular area. These are weapons which could not but be uh, result, result in civilian casualties and in many ways they're intended to be anti-personnel weapons. So that, that kind of, uh, the, the notion that you cannot apply the label terrorism to Western states is one which is born out of propaganda more than uh, a more of a literal definition. After three days of thinking about terrorism and critiquing counter-terrorism, the conference was drawing to a close. But before I left, I had a couple more questions I wanted answered. What don't you like about the language of the war on terrorism as it's used by politicians? Well, the language of the war on terrorism that we have today is, first of all, based around this idea that we can defeat terrorism through war, which is just a ridiculous idea because uh, all the research that's ever been done on uh, understanding how we should deal with terrorism shows that terrorism is a problem that cannot be solved through military means. Uh, terrorism is itself a form of violent political conflict and simply applying and a attempting to apply greater violent violence against these groups simply escalates the situation. Uh, it doesn't deal with the reasons why groups would use violence in the first place. So, I mean, the, the idea of a war against terrorism is, is at that level, I think, fundamentally flawed and it leads to extremely destructive policies like the ones we've seen where you know perhaps up to a million people have died uh, in the attempt to try and eradicate something that cannot be eradicated through military means. So how would you like to see uh, the US and its allies, other NATO countries actually deal with the problem of terrorism that's done on them? Well I think the first uh, point is to try and recognize and try and understand why do, do people want to attack us? What is it that we're doing that provokes them? Uh, are there specific things which they're objecting to and which they feel we're not listening to them uh, about and so therefore they have to use violence? It's very interesting, but in the 1990s, uh, a major study was done which discovered that there was a direct link between US military intervention overseas and a rise in anti-American terrorist attacks. Now, the point about this is that it makes perfect sense. If you go to some country and you bomb them, you invade them, or you help a government there bomb and invade and, and uh, commit violence against people, there is a possibility that out of the people who are opposed to that, some of them will choose to use violence in return. And I mean, this is why uh, we can look at where terrorism occurs in the world and we can see that it always occurs in those places where there are deep problems, where there are deep injustices, where there are political grievances uh, of a major kind. It doesn't occur in sort of happy, peaceful countries. It doesn't occur in New Zealand or Samoa or, you know, other small countries where people are treated basically quite, quite decently. But it does happen in Israel, in Chechnya, in Kashmir, uh, in Iraq, in, in Afghanistan. What's the common denominator? It, it's foreign military intervention. It's violent political conflict. So in that context, terrorism is always likely. Now I think once we understand that, we can then think about how we might be able to deal with conflicts in a non-violent way that will reduce the amount of terrorism directed against Western countries.